Pleasure! What else should bring one anyway? Eating as usual, I see, Algy. I think it is customary in good society to take slight refreshment at... at five o'clock. Where have you been since last Thursday? In the country. What on earth do you do there? When one is in town, one amuses oneself. When one is in the country, one amuses other people. It is excessively boring. And who are the people you amuse? Oh, neighbors, neighbors. Got nice neighbors near part of Shropshire. Perfectly horrid. Never speak to one of them. How immensely you must amuse them. By the way, sorry, seems I've forgotten. Do you? Oh. Algy, you've been having too many of the sandwiches. Why all these cups and sandwiches? Why such reckless extravagance in one so young? Who's coming to tea? Merely Aunt Augusta and Gwendolyn. How perfectly delightful. <laughs> yes, that is all very well, but I'm afraid Aunt Augusta won't quite approve of your being here. May I ask why? My dear fellow, the way you flirt with Gwendolyn is perfectly disgraceful. It's almost as bad as the way Gwendolyn flirts with you. I, I am in love with Gwendolyn. I have come up to town expressly to propose to her. Don't touch the sandwiches. They're made specially for Aunt Augusta. Well, you've been eating them all this time. That is quite a different matter. She's my aunt. Well, I call her aunt. Have some bread and butter. The bread and butter is for Gwendolyn. Oh. You act as if you're married to her already. You are not married to her already. And I'm afraid you never will be. Besides, I don't give my consent. It's your consent! My dear fellow, before I allow you to marry Gwendolyn, you must first answer the question of Cecily. Cecily? What on earth do you mean, Algy? What do you mean by, by Cecily? I don't know anyone by the name of Cecily. <laughs> do you mean to say you've had my cigarette case all this time? It makes no matter. For now that I look at the inscription inside, I see that it is not yours after all. Of course, it's mine. You've seen me with it a hundred times. Yes, but this cigarette case is a present from someone of the name of Cecily, and you just said you didn't know anyone by that name. Well, if you must know, Cecily happens to be my aunt. Why does your aunt call herself Little Cecily? From Little Cecily, with her fondest love. And why does your aunt call you her uncle? From Little Cecily, with her fondest love, to dear Uncle Jack. Besides, her name isn't Jack, it is Ernest. It isn't Ernest. It's Jack. You are the most earnest looking person I've ever met in my life. Well, my name is Ernest in town, and Jack in the country. And the cigarette case was given to me in the country. Go on, tell me the whole thing, and I may mentioned that I've always suspected you of being a secret and confirmed Bunburyist, and I'm quite sure of it now. Bunburyist? First, your explanation? Old Mr. Thomas Carden, who adopted me when I was a little boy, made me in his will guardian to his granddaughter, Miss Cecily Carden. When one is placed in the position of guardian, one has to adopt a very high moral tone on all subjects. 
and as a high moral tone can hardly be said to conduce much to either one's happiness or one's health, I've always pretended to have a younger brother by the name of Ernest, who gets into the most dreadful of scrapes. That, my dear Algy, is the truth, pure and simple. Oh, so what you really are is a Bunburyist. You are one of the most advanced Bunburyists I know. What on earth do you mean? You have invented a very useful younger brother by the name of Ernest, so that you may come up to town whenever you like. I have invented an invaluable permanent invalid by the name of Bunbury, so that I may go down into the country whenever I please. I'm not a Bunburyist. If Gwendolyn accepts me, I'm going to have my brother killed. Indeed, I think I'll have my brother killed in any case. I would Cecily is a little too much interested in him. Never part with Bunbury. Ah, that must be Aunt Augusta. Good afternoon, dear Algernon. I hope you are behaving very well. I'm feeling very well, Aunt Augusta. Dear me, you are smart. You're quite perfect, Miss Fairfax. Oh, I hope I am not that. It will leave very little room for development, and I intend to develop in many directions. I'm sorry if we are a little late. I've quite a treat for you tonight, I'm Algernon. sorry, Aunt Augusta. I'm afraid I won't be able to join you for dinner this evening. Oh, I certainly hope not, Algernon. Yes, my poor friend Bunbury has fallen ill once again. Oh, this Mr. Bunbury seems to suffer from curiously bad health. Yes, poor Bunbury is a dreadful invalid. Mr. Bunbury should make up his mind whether he was going to live or die. I will, um, <clears throat> I will speak with Bunbury, and uh, if he is conscious, and I can assure you he will be by, uh, let's say, on Saturday. Charming day it's been, Miss Fairfax. Whenever people talk to me about the weather, I always feel quite certain that they mean something else, and that makes me so nervous. I do mean something else. I am never wrong. And I would like to be allowed to take advantage of Lady Bracknell's absence. Gwendolyn, ever since I met you, I have admired you more than any girl I have ever met since, well, I met you. Yes, I am well aware of the fact. We live in an age of ideals. The fact is constantly portrayed in the media. And my ideal has always been to love someone of the name Ernest. There's something about that name that produces absolute confidence. When Algeron mentioned to me he had a friend called Ernest, I knew. I was destined to love him. Do you really love me, Gwendolyn? Darling, you don't know how happy you've made me. My own Ernest. But you don't mean to say you couldn't love me if my name wasn't Ernest, do you? Yes, I know it is, but supposing it was something else, you couldn't love me then? Ah, that is a metaphysical speculation and like most metaphysical speculations, have actual reference to the actual facts of real life as we know them. Personally, I don't much care for the name Ernest. I don't think it suits me at all. It suits you quite perfectly. It is a divine name. It has a music of its own. It produces vibrations. <laughs> well, really, Gwendolyn, there are plenty of other much nicer names out there. I think Jack, for instance, a very charming name. Jack? Jack. Jack! No, it has very little music, if any at all. I have known several Jacks, and they all without exception are more than usually plain. Gwendolyn, I must get christened at once. I mean, we must get married at once. Married, Mr. Worthy? Well, surely. You know I love you, and you led me to believe you are not absolutely indifferent to me. Nothing has been said at all about marriage. Well, can I propose to you now? I think it is quite fair to tell him, quite frankly, that I am fully determined to accept. Gwendolyn! Yes, Mr. Worthy, what have you got to say to me? <laughs> you know what I've got to say to you. Yes, but you don't say it to me. Gwendolyn, will you marry me? Of course I will. 5.30. Ernest asked me to marry him. How long he has been about it, I'm afraid he has very little experience in how to propose. My own one. I've never loved anyone in the world but you. 
Mr. Ernest Worthing, come up from that semi-recumbent posture. Algy, I'm not quite finished yet. Finished what, may I ask? I am engaged. Pardon me, you are not engaged to anyone. When you do become engaged, however, I will inform you of the fact. And now, I have a few questions to put to Mr. Worthing. While I am making these inquiries, you, Gwendolyn, will wait for me outside. Mama! Outside, Gwendolyn. Gwendolyn. You can take a seat, Mr. Worthing. Thank you, Lady Bracknell. I prefer standing. Do you smoke? Well, yes, I must admit I smoke. I'm glad to hear it. Every man must always have an occupation of some kind. How old are you? Twenty-one. A very good age to be married at. What is your income? Oh, around <laughs> thousand a year. That is satisfactory. And now to minor matters. Are your parents living? I have lost both my parents. To lose one parent may be regarded as misfortune. To lose both looks like carelessness. Who is your father? I don't know. I said I have lost my parents, but it's nearer to the truth that my parents have lost me. I don't know who I am by birth. I was, well, I was found. Found, y you say? Yes, in the Victorian, in one of the largest railway stations. What were you found in? A handbag. Oh, goodness, a handbag! Oh. In the cloakroom in Victoria Station. I confess I feel somewhat bewildered by what you have just told me, sir. Well, may I ask what you advise I do? I need not say I would do anything to ensure Gwendolyn's happiness. I would say, Mr. Ad Mr. Worthing, I would advise you to try and acquire some relations as soon as possible. Well, I don't know how I could possibly manage that. I can produce the handbag at any moment. It is in my dressing room at home. I'm sure that should be good enough. Hello? Algy, don't play that. How idiotic you are. Didn't it go all right? I'm sure I'm never going to be married to Gwendolyn. Oh. Have you even told her about your being Jack in the country and Ernest in town? Oh, the truth isn't something one tells to a sweet, innocent girl like that. What about your brother? What about the profligate Ernest? Oh, by the end of the week, I'll have gotten rid of him. But didn't you say Cecily was a little interested in him? Cecily is not some silly romantic girl, I'm glad to say. I'd quite like to meet you, Cecily. I would take care that you would never do. Have you told Gwendolyn of Cecily yet? One doesn't blurt these things out to people. I bet you anything, 30 minutes after they meet, they will be calling each other sister. Women only do that after they've called each other a lot of other things first. Algie, kindly turn your back. I have something to say to Mr. Worthing. Ernest. We may never be married. From the expression on Mama's face, I fear we never shall. Few parents nowadays pay any regards to what their children say to them. The old-fashioned respect for the young is fast dying out. Whatever influence I had over Mama, I lost at the age of three. But although she may be able to prevent us from becoming man and wife, there is nothing that she can possibly do that can alter my internal devotion to him. Wonderful. The story of his romantic origin stirred the deeper fibers of my nature. His Christian name has an irresistible fascination. The simplicity of his character is exquisitely incomprehensible to me. What is your address in the country? The Manor House, Walton, Hertfordshire. The Manor House, Walton, Hertfordshire. There is a good postal service, I suppose. It may be necessary to do something serious. That, of course, will take serious consideration. I'll communicate with you daily. Now there goes a smart, sensible girl. The only girl I've loved in my life. What are you so amused at? Oh, um, nothing. Just Bunbury's peculiar situation. If you're not careful, your friend Bunbury can get you into a serious 
break someday. Oh, nonsense, Jack. You speak nothing but nonsense. No one ever does. Surely watering your virtual garden is not necessary at this moment. Your German grammar is on the table. Open it at page 15. We will repeat yesterday's lesson. But I don't like German. It's not at all becoming language. And besides, I know I look quite plain after my German lesson. Child, you know how anxious your guardian is. Mr. Worthing has many troubles in his life. You must remember his constant anxiety over that unfortunate young man, his brother. I wish Uncle Jack would allow that unfortunate young man, his brother, to come down here sometime. Cecily? I could be a good influence on Miss Prism. I'm such a good influencer. In fact, I keep a diary in order to have all my secrets. If not, I shall forget all about them. Read. Is that Dr. Chasuble? Dr. Chaz? To your work. And how are we this morning? It would do me so much good to go out on a short stroll with you in the park. I hope Cecily is not inattentive. Cecily is so inattentive. If I were fortunate enough to be Miss Prism's pupil, I would hang upon her lips. What? Hello? Dr. Chaz? Oh, that? I spoke metaphorically. My metaphor was drawn from bees. <clears throat> that would be lovely. Cecily, you will read your polit political economy in my absence. You are little Cecily, I'm sure. Mr. Ernest Worthing? Uncle Jack's brother? I am not little. In fact, I believe I'm more than usually tall for my age. But I am, Cecily. You, I see, are Uncle Jack's brother. Ernest, the wicked Ernest. <laughs> I'm not really wicked at all. I hope you have not been leading a double life, pretending to be wicked, but then actually being really good all the time. That would be hypocrisy. Uncle Jack won't be back till Monday afternoon. I don't have to be back until Monday morning. <laughs> I think you better wait till Uncle Jack comes back. I know he wants to speak to you about your immigrating to Australia. Australia? I'd sooner die. You are looking a little pale. That is because I am hungry. Oh, how thoughtless of me. <clears throat> I'm hungry? Don't you come in. Cecily? 
Mr. Worthing, this is indeed a surprise. We did not look for you till Monday afternoon. I have returned sooner than I expected. I trust this garb of woe does not betoken some terrible calamity. My brother. Dead. <laughs> Your brother Ernest dead? Quite dead. <laughs> what a lesson for him. I trust he will profit by it. You know the Reverend, Dr. Chaz, could hold the funeral. He does funerals, christenings, confirmations. Uh, that reminds me. You mentioned christenings. The fact is, I would like to be christened myself this afternoon. But surely, Mr. Worthing, you have been christened already. I don't remember anything about it. Can you see if he's available? Hello, Dr. Chaz? No, Mr. Worthing's here right now. No, he can't hear, but... <clears throat> he would like to be christened at... Five? Five? No, it's bingo. Oh. Half past five? Half past five? Yes, he'll be there at half past five. <laughs> no, Mr. Worthing's still here. <laughs> yes, later. Bye-bye. Uncle Jack! What horrid clothes you got on? Go and change them, Cecily. Guess who's in the dining room? Your brother Ernest! What nonsense! I haven't got a brother! Good heavens. I have come down from town to tell you that I'm very sorry for all the trouble that I've caused you and that I plan to lead a better life in the future. Oh. I see. I admit that the faults were all on my side, but I must say, Jack's cruelty to me is especially painful, considering that this is the first time that I have come here. Uncle Jack, if you don't shake hands with Ernest, I will never forgive you. Oh, I think we might leave the two brothers together. I feel very happy. Your duty as a gentleman calls you back. My duty as a gentleman has never interfered with my pleasures in the slightest. Besides, Cecily is darling. You are not to talk about Miss Cardew like that. I don't like it. Well, I don't like your clothes. You look perfectly disgraceful. Why on earth don't you go up and change? Will you go if I change my clothes? Perhaps, if you do not take too long. I've never seen someone take so long to dress and with such little result. You really have no taste in neckties. Well, at any rate, it's better than always being overdressed as you are. If I am occasionally overdressed, I always make up for it by being exceptionally overeducated. <sighs> He's going to send me away. Then does that mean we have to part? You can wait five minutes. I hope, Cecily. Excuse me. You see, it is simply a young girl's record of her thoughts and impressions, and consequently meant for the public. So, Ernest, don't stop. I am quite ready for more. <clears throat> oh, I... don't cough, Ernest. Cecily, ever since. I looked upon your wonderful and incomparable beauty. I've dared to love you wildly, passionately, devotedly, hopelessly, relentlessly. Wait. And you shouldn't say you love me wildly, passionately, devotedly, and hopelessly. Hopelessly doesn't make much sense, does it? Cecily, I... Cecily, I love you. You will marry me, won't you? Silly boy, we've been engaged for the last three months. For the last three months? Yes, it'll be three months on Thursday. Darling, and when was the engagement settled? On the 14th of February last, 
Worn out by your entire ignorance of my existence, I went out to end the matter one way or the other. With the long struggle with myself, I accepted you. But then the next day, I bought this ring in your name and this bangle with the true lover's knot I promised you always to wear. I didn't. And then the three emails you wrote me after I had broken off the engagement were so beautiful and so badly spelled that even now, I can hardly think about it without crying little. But was the engagement ever broken off? Yes, on March, of the, on the 22nd of March. And today, I broke off my engagement with Ernest. I, I feel that it is better to do so. Oh, wow, the weather still remains to be charming. But why on earth would you break off the engagement? Especially when the weather was so charming. It wouldn't have hardly been a serious engagement if it hadn't been broken off at least once or twice. But I forgave it before the week was out. You'll never break off our engagement again, Cecily? Of course not. But there is the question of your name. <clears throat> yes, uh, of course. You must not laugh at me, darling, but I've always had this girlish dream of mine to love someone with the name of Ernest. It brings out so much character. I pity any poor woman who's married and their husband's name is not Ernest. Do you mean to say you could not love me had I some other name? But what name? <laughs> oh, um, any name you like. Um. Oh, I don't know. Uh, Algernon, for instance. I don't like the name of Algernon. Excuse me, Ernest. I might respect you, and I might admire your character, but I feel that I should not be able to give you my undivided attention. I must be christened. I mean, I must leave. For most important business. Okay. I'll be back in no time. I'm here for Mr. Worthing. Isn't he in his library? No. Pray, let me introduce myself. My name is Cecily Cardew. Cecily Cardew? Cecily Cardew, what a very sweet name. I have a great feeling we are going to be friends. My first impressions of people are never wrong. I love how you already like me, even though we've known each other for such a short period of time. Perhaps this might be a favorable opportunity for me to mention who I am. My name is Gwendolyn, my father is Lord Bracter. I said that from Mr. Popular and I is entirely God's say and wrong. And you? I am very fond of being looked at. You are here on a short visit, I suppose. Oh, no. I live here. Really? Yes. My guardian, with the assistance of Miss Prism, has the arduous task of looking after me. Your guardian? Yes. Mr. Worthing is... I am his ward. It is quite strange. He never mentions me at a ward. How secretive of him. He goes more interesting hourly. My dear Cecily, now that I know you are Mrs. W Mr. Worthing's ward, I will say I wish you were, well, just a little bit older than you seem to be, and not so quite alluring in appearance. In fact, if I may speak candidly... Pray do. I think when someone has anything unpleasant to say, they should always speak with quite candor. Well, to speak with perfect candor, Cecily, I wish you were fully 42, and more than usually plain for your age. See, Ernest has a strong, upright nature, but even men of the most moral noble... Excuse me, Gwendolyn. But did you say Ernest? Yes. I know Ernest. Really? Yes. In fact, I'm going to be his. I beg your pardon? Dearest Gwendolyn, I should make it of no secret to you. Me and Ernest are engaged to be married. <laughs> My dear Cecily, there must be some slight error. For Mr. Ernest Worthing is engaged to me. You must be under some misconception because he proposed to me about 10 minutes ago. That is oddly strange, for he proposed to me yesterday. 5.30. Ernest asked me to marry him. How long he has been about it. I am afraid he has very little experience in how to propose. Well, it seems to me that he obviously has changed his mind. If Ernest may be entrapped to any foolish promise, I shall consider it my duty to rescue him at once. Whatever and when they burn that my poor boy has gotten into, I shall never reapproach him after we were married. Shall I offer you some tea, Miss Fairfax? 
Sugar. No, thank you. I'm on a diet. Cake or bread and butter? I'm on a diet. You have filled my tea with sugar and cake. Only to save my poor boy from any problem that he's gotten himself into. There are no links to where I should not go. From the moment I met you, I distrusted you. I thought you were false and deceitful. I have never been deceived in such matters. My first impressions of people are invariably right. It seems to me, Miss Fairfax, that I am trespassing on your invaluable time. There are no matters that you have the same character to deal with in the neighborhood. Are you engaged to be married to this young lady? To Cecily? Of course not. What could have put that idea into your pretty little head? Thank you. I knew there was some misunderstanding. For this is my, my guardian. I beg your pardon? This is my Uncle Jack. Son of a bitch. Ernest, are you engaged to be married to this young lady? To what? Good heavens, Gwendolyn. Yes, to good heavens, Gwendolyn. No, what would put an idea on your pretty little head? I am not little, but thank you. I knew there must have been some slight error. This gentleman is my cousin, Algernon Moncrief. Are you called Algernon? I cannot deny it. Is your name really John? It seems to me that deception has been practiced on both of us. Jack, there is just one more question I must ask you. Where is your brother Ernest? Yes, we are both engaged to be married to Ernest. I will tell you quite frankly that I have no brother Ernest. I have no brother at all. I have never had a brother in my life, and I certainly do not have the smallest intention of having one in the future. Let's go inside. They'll hardly come to venture after us. No, men are so cowardly, <laughs> aren't they? Wait, so sweet. This ghastly state of things is what you call bumburying, I suppose? Yeah. Well, the only small satisfaction I have in this whole wretched business is that your friend Bunbury is quite exploded. As for your conduct towards Miss Cardew, I must say that I find it inexcusable you taking on such a sweet, innocent girl like that. Not to mention the fact that she is my ward. There's no defense for you taking advantage of a very experienced young lady like Miss Fairfax, despite the fact that she's my cousin. I wanted to be engaged to Gwendolyn. I love her. And I wanted to be engaged to Cecily. I adore her. There is certainly no chance of that happening. Well, I can see no way of you reuniting with Miss Fairfax. That is none of your business. If it were my business, I wouldn't talk about it. It's very vulgar to talk about one's business. Ooh -ooh. How can you sit there? Calmly eating muffins. Well, I cannot eat muffins in an agitated manner. I say it's perfectly heartless you're eating muffins at all. I'm eating because I am upset. And right now, I'm very sad. Besides, I like muffins. Algy, I wish to goodness you would go. I can't. I've made an appointment with Dr. Chasuble a quarter to six. The sooner you give up that nonsense, the better. I, myself, have already made arrangements with Dr. Chasuble to be christened at 5.30. I would naturally take on the name of Ernest. Gwendolyn would wish it. We can't both be christened Ernest. That's absurd. Jack, you are at the muffins again. Algy, I have already told you I want you to go. Why don't you go? Because there's still one muffin. Ugh. as anyone else would, seems to show they have some sense of shame left. They're eating muffins. It looks like a sign of repentance. Hmm. They don't seem to notice us. They're looking at us. 
What effrontery. They're coming toward us. How forward of them. Let's preserve a dignified silence. Let's preserve a dignified silence. Certain. Yeah. Yeah. No, don't do that. Your heart. Beyonce. Screw what? Your mom says we will discern this and we'll both be earnest but we are two men who lied to you to our brides we protest and we'll change it to earnest tell me why ain't like I got a name say but tell me why won't make a promise I'll break I'll tell you why We'll make it so it isn't fake Ernest is the name I'll take Tell me why Wait, wait, wait! You are prepared to be re-Christianed? I am To please me, are you ready to do this? I am Darling! Darling. Hello? Gwendolyn, what is going on? I am prepared to be engaged to Mr. Worthing. Gwendolyn, s sit down. Sit down. sit down immediately. Hesitation of any kind is a sign of mental decay in the young, a physical weakness in the old. Mama! No, no to the left, left! Hold that thought, Gwendolyn. I'm on my way now. I am engaged to be married to Gwendolyn, Lady Bracknell. Algie, don't you dare go anywhere. You are nothing of the kind, sir. And now Algernon. Algernon! Just hang up on her. Shh. Uh, yes, Aunt Augusta? May I ask who that young lady I just heard is? That lady is Miss Cecily Cardew, my ward. At not so little, Cecily, 731. I am engaged to be married to Cecily, Aunt Augusta. I beg your pardon. Mr. Moncrief and I are engaged to be married, Lady Bracknell. I do not know whether there is anything peculiarly exciting in the air, but the number of engagements that go on seems to me considerably above average. I think some preliminary inquiry on my part would not be out of place. Mr. Worthing, is Miss Cardew at all connected with any of the larger railway stations in London? I merely desire information. Until yesterday, I had no idea that there were any families or persons whose origin was a terminus. How extremely kind of you, Lady Bracknell. As a matter of form, Mr. Worthing, I'd better ask you if Miss Cardew has any little fortune. Oh, about 1.3 million in the trust fund. That is all. Goodbye, Lady Bracknell. Jack! Hello? A moment, Mr. Worthing. 1.3 million dollars. And in the trust fund. Hmm, let me just... Oh, yes, here she is. At not so little, Cecily. Cecily. Follow me. Mm, yes, Miss Carden seems to me a most attractive young lady. Oh. oh, but your hair and your dress is sadly simple, but we can soon alter all that. Yes, there, there are distinct social possibilities in Miss Carden's profile. Cecily is the most beautiful, smartest woman I've ever met. I don't give two pence about social possibilities. Never speak disrespectfully of social media, Algernon. Only people who can't get into it do that. The marriage, I think, had better take place quite soon. <sighs> Thank you, Aunt Augusta. 
To speak frankly, I am not in favor of long engagements. They give people the opportunity of finding out each other's character before marriage, which I think is never advisable. Pardon me for interrupting you, Lady Bracknell, but this engagement is quite out of the question. I am a Cecily's gar guardian, and she cannot marry until she comes of age and has consent. That consent, I absolutely decline to give. Upon what grounds, may I ask? It pains me to speak frankly to you, Lady Bracknell, but I find Algernon's character to be untruthful. After careful consideration, I have decided to overlook his conduct to you. <laughs> that is extremely kind of you, Lady Bracknell. However, my own decision is unalterable. There is no marriage. However, that is entirely in your hands. The moment you agree to my marriage with Gwendolyn, I will happily allow your nephew to form an alliance with my ward. You must be aware that what you propose is entirely out of the question. Yes? It's time for the christenings. The christenings? Isn't that not so much premature? Is that ever tragical? Yes. Hey, it's Cecily. So, I had something to tell you. Miss Prism has been waiting in your office. Yeah, like an hour, half an hour ago. Yeah, I know. Sorry. Bye. Miss Prism, did I hear you mention a Miss Prism? Yes. Is this Miss Prism a female of repellent aspect, remotely uh, considered with education? Miss Prism has, for the last three years, been Miss Cecily Cardew's esteemed tutor and valued companion. I must see her at once. No, talk right here. Right here. Hello? I wonder what that was all about. <clears throat> Hello, Miss Prism. Cecily? Did you talk to Dr. Chaz when I asked? I have been waiting for an hour and three quarters. Prism! Come here, Prism! Prism, where is that baby? Twenty-four years ago, Prism, you left my dear friend's house in charge of a stroller that contained a baby of the male sex. You never returned. A few weeks later, due to the elaborate efforts of the Metropolitan Police, the stroller was discovered by itself at midnight in an alleyway. It contained the manuscript of an erotic Jane Austen fan fiction novel. But the baby wasn't there. So tell me, Prism, where is that baby? Lady Bracknell, I admit with shame that I do not know. I only wish I did. On the morning of the day you mention, a day that is forever branded on my memory, I prepared to take the baby out as usual. I had also with me a somewhat old handbag in which I had intended to place the manuscript of a work of fiction I had written during my few unoccupied hours. In a moment of mental abstraction, for which I can never forgive myself, I placed the manuscript in the stroller and place the baby in the handbag. But where did you place the handbag? Do not ask me, Mr. Warning. Miss Prism, this is a matter of no small importance to me. I left it in the cloakroom of one of the larger railway stations. What station? Victoria. that means? I dare not even suspect. Is this the hand? 
take that. It seems to be mine. Yes. Here is the injury it received through the upsetting of a Gower Street bus in younger and happier days. And here is the stain from an explosion of a temperance beverage, an incident that occurred on Leamington. And here on the lock are my initials. I had forgotten that I had had them placed there. The bag is undoubtedly mine. I am so glad to have it restored to me. It has been a great inconvenience being without it all these years. Miss Prism, more is restored to you than just the handbag. I was the baby you placed in it. You? Yes! Mother. Mr. Worthing, there is some error. There is the lady who can tell you who you truly are. You are the son of my dear friend, Constance Moncrief. And consequently, Algernon's older brother. Algy's elder brother? <laughs> I always knew I had a brother. I, I, didn't I say I always had a brother? Cecily, how could you doubt that I ever had a brother? Miss Prism, my unfortunate brother. Gwendolyn, my unfortunate brother. Algy, you young rascal, you've never treated me like a brother before in your life. <clears throat> <clears throat> My own. But what own are you? I'd quite forgotten that point. I suppose your position on my name is irrevocable. Well, then we better get it cleared up at once. At the time Miss Prism had left me in the handbag, had I been christened already? Every luxury that money could afford, including christening, was lavished upon you by your fond and doting parents. And I was christened. That settles it. Then let me know the worst of it. Go on. Well, being the eldest son, you were naturally christened after your father. Algy, do you remember our father's Christian name? Father and I were barely on speaking terms. He died before I was one. Well, that settles it. Thursday. The worst day of my life. Ernest... What's this? Oh, that? That's been there forever. Nearly just a part of the house. Somebody ought to clean up around here. It's not my job. Who still writes letters anyway? My dear son, Ernest. I'm so glad that we decided to name you Ernest. Love always your father. Ernest Moncrief! I knew I couldn't love any other name. My own one. Cecily, at last. You seem to be displaying signs of triviality. On the contrary, I finally realized the vital importance of being earnest.
One. Wait, wait, wait. Come on. <laughs> Come on, Mark. Okay. One, two, three. And that's the importance of being.